thank you very much. We're enormously grateful to the Shivers family for uh, endowing this uh, lecture series that we do each year. And um, I'm particularly pleased tonight uh, to welcome Mas Masumoto uh, to present our Shivers lecture this year. Uh, Mas has been a dear friend of mine for a number of years. We uh, run into each other in uh, meetings like this across the country. And um, I, you know, I could go through a long litany of, you know, all of his accomplishments and all that. And you know, whenever somebody does those kind of introductions, they're sort of boring to me. And the last thing I want to do is have you get bored about an introduction to Moss because he is such a delightful and interesting person. Um, and so, uh, rather than doing that, I, you know, I, I do want you to know that uh, if you've read any of the material in the, the. Uh, 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 PR around Moss's uh, lecture tonight, you know that he's uh, the author of eight books. In addition to being uh, a farmer on his own farm, uh, he's a third generation uh, farmer out in California, um, and his daughter is now moving in to become the fourth generation, so it's uh, one of those delightful stories that we don't, don't often hear about agriculture today, to, to see a farm stay within families, within the family uh, through, uh, through four generations. So that in itself is, a, is an accomplishment of, uh, of no small means. Um, but what I'd like to do, you know, I, I first became acquainted uh, with Moss's work through one of his books, you know, which is still, and this is not to at all in any way suggest that his more recent books aren't fantastic because they are and they're many of them on the table tonight, so if you're interested at, at the end of this, uh, you can uh, you know, get a copy if you're on. But uh, still my favorite book was his book entitled The Epitaph for a Peach. And um, when I read this, it was such a, a uh, you, know, and I, you know, as you know, I'm a farmer myself, and, and I could feel myself inside of his body and inside of his mind as he was writing about these things. And so I thought that uh, one of the best ways, if you haven't, especially if, if, if you haven't read any of his stuff, um, I want to introduce you to him by reading just a couple of short paragraphs from uh, his epitaph for a peach. And this is where you know, he talks about his family and, and their involvement in the farm and what things are like on the farm, etc. He finally gets to this point in the book where he begins to talk about, about marketing his peaches. And he says, uh, I can no longer delay the hunt. I force myself to stop walking the fields and embark on finding a market for these wonderful tasting but homeless peaches. <laughs> Too easily, I've procrastinated with the excuse, I grow the fruit, that's what I do best, let somebody else worry about selling it. I hope a miracle will happen. A produce retailer reading the LA Times article about my peaches will become obsessed with my fruit. I base my fantasy on the thought that good things happen to good peaches. <laughs> Marcy, which is his wife, claims, I'm now becoming a real farmer, hopelessly naive. <laughs> I pitch my family, food not, not, my family food, not fast food slogan, so a few fruit brokers, these middlemen, and most of them are men, supposedly do all us farmers a favor by using their professional skills to find the best buyers for our fruit, creating a perfect match. On paper, the system sounds fair, but in reality, the buyer most always has the upper hand, especially with the perishable crop. Few deals are negotiated in advance. Instead, frantic brokers search for buyers as soon as the peaches are picked and packed in boxes, thousands of packages waiting shipment in cold storage. It's a stacked deck, one farmer explains. There's a reason why we call them brokers. They're good at helping farmers go broke. <laughs> I start with a series of phone calls, and over half the brokers laugh when I mention Suncrest, one of the varieties of his peaches. I ask, why the chuckle? They refer to a, marius, a mysterious blacklist with Suncrest near the top, tainted with a reputation for lousy color and terrible shelf life. Fruit brokers want peaches that last for weeks in cold storage without becoming mealy and soft. We want color and shelf life, Col shelf life and color. I hear over and over again, suncasts are stereotyped, condemned by a deeply entrenched prejudice. It would make a 60s style revolution to, become, to overcome that bigotry. But the taste, I plead, the taste. 
that brings even louder laughter from some. And so I wanted to share those couple of paragraphs with you because Masa Masamoto is one of those farmers who is a who, who charts a new path, and that is that it isn't just about color and shelf life. He has not been willing as a farmer to accommodate his farming operation to what the traditional market wants. He decided to be a farmer that was going to give people what they wanted, and that's a really good tasting peach. And so tonight, Moss, I am so proud to have you here. Welcome to Iowa State University. Thank, thank you, Fred. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to apologize by my very casual appearance. Uh, I arrived this afternoon, and of course, my luggage got lost. Uh, and also, uh, we, uh, the process of getting here was a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, earlier this past week, I thought I was 20 years old, and I jumped off my tractor and my 50-year-old knees told me otherwise, uh, so I might be hobbling around up here. And when I uh, uh, injured my, my, my knee, I thought, what was I thinking? And it dawned on me that I think I was inspired by the Olympics. Uh, <laughs> so I got to thinking, what would a farmer Olympics be like? Right? And I thought, well, maybe it'd be like a tractor slalom, right, going in and out of the gates. <laughs> But what, we, what you would have is at certain gates, certain things would break on the tractor. <laughs> and, and you'd have to get off and repair it before you get to the next gate. So that would be one event. And another one I thought of was, that was the ski jump. And all of us farmers, right, were used to soaring in the air with new heights without an exit plan. <laughs> so I thought that would be a good event. And the, the other event might be a bobsled. And a farmer would be a great at being one of the ones that push it and jump in, duck their heads down, and don't have a clue what they're doing <laughs> as they're barreling down the, the, uh, the course to the rest of their, their farm year and everything. Um, it was a little challenge to get here uh, in that uh, last night at midnight, I was in the ER room in Corvallis, Oregon, because uh, this knee injury that I had turned out to be a major knee infection uh, with that. Uh, but uh, it worked out well. Uh, it wasn't anything major other than I'm, I have a lot of antibiotics on me and in me at this point. Uh, there was a challenge because the ER doctor said there is a side effect with this uh, uh, large doses of antibiotics you might get some diarrhea. <laughs> so I laid there, and this is at midnight last night, thinking, okay, I have the Shivers Lecture or diarrhea. <laughs> Shivers Lecture or diarrhea. And I thought, which is more important? That's why I'm here tonight. The That was probably the first time ever someone applauded me <laughs> to have diarrhea. <laughs> so I will, you folks in Iowa have your own sense of humor, I could tell. Oh, okay. Thank you, Fred. Thank you for the Shivers family uh, for uh, bringing me here. And hopefully tonight I could share some stories and certainly answer some questions that you may have. Uh, when I started writing, I wasn't sure who my audience would be. Because uh, I was just a farmer. My, our farm is in the middle of California, about 20 miles south of Fresno. Uh, we were one of the first farmers to farm organically in the 80s. Uh, and we did it not because there was organic markets. We just thought it would be something right for our operation. Uh, and I also started writing at that time. I considered myself a late bloomer because uh, I didn't write much. I certainly wasn't an English major or anything. Uh, and I remember once uh, I had finished writing and uh, published Epitaph for a Peach, and I was in a, uh, I did a reading at a bookstore, and the next morning I was at a neighborhood cafe uh, signing some books. And one of the wait staff saw me and, and said, hey, there's someone who's, you know, written a book about a peach. Uh, and then they saw the cover of Epitaph for a Peach. 
And they went back to talk with some of their friends in the back room, and I went to follow them to get another cup of coffee. And I heard, overheard them say, you know, there's a famous writer out there. He wrote this book about a wonderful peach. I think the book's title is James and the Giant Peach. <laughs> It taught me one of the best lessons about writing and farming, though, and it's that idea that I farm by stories. Uh, all these stories have memory, and that's where I draw my inspiration and my greatest lessons that I have while I work our fields. It's part of as if each story is baggage that I carry with me, and each generation carries that same type of baggage. And that sensibility sometimes becomes very acute uh, and it, it well there's a turning point on our farm when you carry this baggage of history this baggage of story and you may not understand or know it until something happens and I'll read a short paragraph from uh, the latest book Wisdom of the Last Farmer that talked about one of those moments I walk, walk up and stand next to Dad by the tractor, and we lean together towards his thundering engine to listen. I, then I look at his face. He's having a stroke. The right side of his face droops, his eyelid almost sealed shut, his eyes glazed. He looks lost and doesn't recognize me. As he begins to limp around the tractor, I hold on to him, trying to keep him from stumbling and falling. I don't know what to do, but I think I should try, I should first shut off the engine and then get him inside the house. I feel responsible. In my drive to grow the perfect peach and the sweetest raisins, have I contributed to the sudden illness of my father? Could he die because of me? I manage to turn off the engine, and as the tractor rumbles to a stop, I try to maneuver Dad inside, but he fights me, insisting on returning to the tractor. Still in shock, I give in to his will, feeling such, Greek, such guilt. Dad reaches for the tractor seat cushion. At the end of the workday, we traditionally flip it, flip the pad so the morning dew will not collect on and bother the next driver. With trembling left hand, he flips it, then allows me to guide him away, his right arm, his dominant hand, dangling as if lifeless, and together we limp toward the farmhouse. So that began this another, a new journey in my life. It was the realization that I was no longer the son of a farmer. I would probably now become the farmer. And part of that idea also surrounded the notion that we farm with memory, and my dad was the embodiment of that memory, and did I have the memory to farm? One of the ways I realized, too, for my father to recover was that I would have to teach him how to farm again. And that's what much of Wisdom of the Last Farmer talks about. But it's also this notion of understanding that cultural frame of the work that we do. We farmers often get caught up into the economics and the ideas of efficiency and productivity, which are all important parts of farming, but they're not the only part. Part of what matters is the memories and the wisdom that is passed down. And part of that wisdom is, is embedded in a very, very simple thought, and it's the idea that farming takes hard work. It's something that's not easily done, and it can't be easily done. But so is life in many ways. Uh, and this short chapter, this short section, excuse me, uh, talks about during my father's recovery in, in therapy, when he works with the physical therapist, we were working on him, how, learning, trying to teach him how to walk. And this passage talks about this. In life, as in recovery, not all things are level and smooth. Dad has to learn how to walk on dirt, I announced to his doctor and the team of therapists. They stare at me initially puzzled, and I have to remind them there are no sidewalks on the farm. Dad has to learn how to walk on uneven ground. He can't, if he can't walk on dirt, 
I'm not so sure he'll want to come home. And the reality was, of course, all the therapy sessions were conducted on sidewalks or flat ground. This was an, a cultural frame that they had forgotten. It was a cultural understanding that, do they know where their food comes from? It comes from the ground and it comes from dirt. It made me realize even more so part of that challenge that all of us farmers have, and that is trying to teach the world that we also need to walk on uneven ground. Uh, for our family especially, uh, the context of where we farm and how we farm is important. I'm Japanese American. My grandparents immigrated from Japan over 100 years ago. Uh, they were farm workers in California, partly based on very racist alien land laws that prevented them and excluded them from owning land. My parents and grandparents were interned in a relocate, relocation camps during World War II. They were uprooted and forced to live in prisons in different parts of the United States. My parents lived in one south of Phoenix at a place called Gila River, Arizona, where there 10,000 Japanese Americans were lived in a barbed wire con confinement there for four years. That's part of that culture of memory I carry with me, and it's part of the way I farm. It reminds me the story that for immigrants, there were no sidewalks on their lands. They, too, had to learn about the history of how to farm and where they farm. Tonight, I also wanted to show you a little three-minute video about our farm. Uh, and one, of, one way is that you could get a visual impression of our farm, our peaches. Uh, and I hope this works. We will find out. Uh, and the other part of it, too, was the notion that um, you could see I really do farm. Uh, I have done readings at, at um, stores, and people go, you write so well, uh, do you really farm? <laughs> so hopefully this video will work, and this will be proof that we do farm. OK, I pressed play. I pressed play. This, this is the third time in a row something like this has happened. Where Well, it appears, oh, no. <laughs> this is some crew practical joke that Fred has played on me, huh, <laughs> on this. If it doesn't work in 10 seconds, we're going to skip this. So. All right. Go ahead and start it. I don't want to press anything here. <laughs> Wisdom of the last farmer, harvesting legacies from the land. Wisdom of the last farmer is the story of a family farm, a stroke, and the perfect peach. My father had been a simple farmer his entire life, and in 1997, part of that life was taken away by a major stroke. My quest was then to take over the farm and help him recover. In order for him to heal, I had to teach my father how to farm again. And in the process, I discovered the wisdom of his work and the life lessons left behind in the land. Let me share a passage from Wisdom of the Last Farmer. 
Once Dad picked a golden peach and wiped it on his shirt, in what would become a new ritual for our first pick of the day, he leaned over and took a bite. Juice dripped, flesh oozed from his mouth. He grinned happy like a child and offered me a bite. We didn't exchange many words. They're ready, he said, just right. With the first perfect peach of that season, I rediscovered my passion. I renewed my calling to save the living legacy of great heirlooms and to communicate their stories through flavors and traditions from one generation to the next. Each season finds me continuing to search for perfection. But while Dad is in the hospital, unconscious from his stroke, I sit alone during the evening in the growing stillness and quiet. I fight the urge to leave and go home. What good am I doing? Little to show for hours of sitting around, but I feel I need to stay and talk. I tell Dad about my day in the fields. The weeds. The weeds are everywhere. You know how spring is, Dad. Fools you with warmth, tricks you into optimism. Then come the weeds, even before the first peach blossoms. I stare at his dark outline in the shadows. The farm can use your help, I say out loud. There's no response. Then I cry, how in the hell am I going to take care of all the weeds without you. From Wisdom of the Last Farmer by David Moss Masamoto, I hope you'll enjoy my stories. Well, I hope you enjoyed that in a kind of visual tour into the farm. It's funny, I have so, I'm so used to seeing those images. So when I see a, a peach tree full of those branches, that's how they're supposed to look. Uh, uh, interestingly, a peach tree will generate probably anywhere from four to 600 pounds of peaches each tree. Uh, 100 acres of tree, we have 25 to 30 acres of peaches and nectarines. So this is a lot of fruit out there. Uh, uh, but it also uh, is part of that sense of history embedded in the work that we do. Uh, as a writer, I've always understood the power of words. And during my father's therapy, there was a term that intrigued me that some of the therapists started using. They called having a stroke an insult. And I thought about that, and I asked them to explain it. And they said certain injuries, sometimes a heart attack, certain other types of, of uh, ailments, they could be fixed through medication or surgery. A stroke isn't fixed. You could be, try to recover part from part of it, but in many ways, a stroke damages the brain the same way the body becomes insulted. And the question then becomes, how do re you respond to that insult? As a farmer, I thought about that, and I thought in many ways, we have been insulted by a system that rewards cheap food. We've been insulted by a system that devalues the work that we do. So the challenge then becomes, what, how do we, do we respond to that insult? Because how we respond becomes the way we are identified. It becomes the way we gain identity. And it made me think of this whole new way of looking at peach diseases. So I have a new category. I'm not a trained entomologist. I'm not a trained plant pathologist. But I have three new diseases I've never seen recorded in any of the literature. The three new peach diseases are size, color, and cosmetics. And once we look at peaches and many other commodities that way, we begin to see them in a new way of defining them. 
And with that new way of defining, it's my response to the insult that I see happening in, a, in much in the modern conventional marketplace. In order for my dad to recover, though, from his stroke, I had, it was important for him to realize he needed to be identified as a farmer. And one thing a farmer, in my eyes, at least on our farm, uh, becomes identified with is, of course, his tractor. So there is this old West Country Western song by Gene Autry called Back in the Saddle Again. And there's this idea that I had to see if I could get Dad back in the saddle. Because no matter how much he recovered, it wouldn't be until he could drive a tractor that I think he would feel he's back on the farm. Now the doctors had warned us my dad should never operate any type of dangerous equipment. So we waited for a day my mom went shopping. <laughs> and I asked my dad, would he like to try to drive the tractor? And he immediately nodded his head, went back. And uh, we have, and most of our tractors are what they call a low profile orchard model because they have to fit under the branches of the peach trees that you saw. So, uh, so the question was, could he get back up on a tractor? So we thought about it. The stroke had damaged his right side. So we figured out a new way for him to be able to get up. And he got up on the tractor. And I crawled up on there, stood on the running board, leaned against the fender. And he sat there, very proud. And I felt very content at that moment. And I actually wanted to stop. Because right? I said, I don't want to have a test and failure. But I knew Dad wanted to do something more. So I said, Dad, do you remember how to start a tractor? And he looked at me. And then he turned the key, because he remembered where the key was. And he pulled down on the throttle. The engine started up. We throttled up. And I said, he remembers this. Except the throttle was a little high. Then he looked at me, and I said, and he kind of smiled, <laughs> pushed on the clutch, put the tractor in gear, and popped the clutch. And we began roaring down the road, <laughs> bouncing down this avenue, went around a corner, and I leaned over and I said, Dad, don't you think we're going a little fast? And then he pulled the throttle down even faster. So we're, we're roaring down this road. Dust is kicking up, bouncing all along. And I leaned over to Dad. I said, Dad, I think we're going too fast. And he goes even faster. And I look at him, and this was a moment of, of epiphany. I looked at him and realized that he was smiling, smiling like a child. He had returned to the farm, and we had a row reversal. Because now, just as he had taught me how to farm and how to drive a tractor some 35 years earlier, now I was teaching him that. Just as he was the farmer then and I was the student, the roles had been reversed. It was a moment of transformation, of understanding that the best farms constantly go through these transformations. And transformations are crucial to any farm, especially a small farm, in their, in their hope for survival. It was part of that understanding of the past that I did not want to forget, and how that past, learning and remembering how I learned how to drive a tractor too fast, was also part of that new future of the farm, watching my dad drive a tractor way too fast in that respect. Uh, but it's that notion of transformation, I think, that becomes just crucial to all of us as we evolve on our land. Oh, I'm trying to find this next section. I guess I wasn't sure where I put this. Uh, I wanted to share with you another passage huh, about understanding the transformations that occur on the farm. And this is from Epitaph for a Peach. And understanding that even though you believe you understand how to work the land, there are constantly new lessons to be learned. I used to have armies of weeds on my farm. They launched their annual assault with the first warm weather of spring, parachuting seeds behind enemy lines and poking up in scattered clumps around in the fields. Oh, excuse me. 
But now I have very few weeds on our farm. I removed them in a single day using a very simple method. I didn't even break into a sweat. I simply redefined what I called the weed. <laughs> See, these moments of transformation could occur anywhere. So. It began with an uncomfortable feeling like a muse whispering in my ear, which led to an observation about barren landscapes. It doesn't make sense to try to grow juicy grapes and luscious peaches in sterile ground. The terms juicy and luscious connote land that's alive, green most of the year with plants that celebrate the coming of life. A turning point came when his friend started calling his weeds by a new name. He referred to them as natural grasses. I liked that term. It didn't sound as evil as weeds. It had a soft, gentle tone about it. So I came to think of my weeds as part of a natural system at work on the farm, part of allowing nature to take over the work that we did. Weeds, that land, all of that became part, of course, of that transformation that was occurring and part of the reframing of my father's stroke and also my role on the farm. Because there tends to be a tendency when we define ourselves in economic terms, when we become inefficient, it leads to becoming obsolete. Was my dad now obsolete? If someone's if something is obsolete, it's no longer needed nor wanted. And I refuse to let that happen because I always had felt that you don't just throw things away. And we live in an economic system that often throws away the farmer before the land, which seems backwards to me. But it made me re-look at the, the simple things on our farm, not in a, in a uh, definition like an ag economist, economist would use it, not as a, a scientist might turn, uh, look at it, but possibly as a farmer and maybe a farmer who writes would look at it. So I wrote this passage that hopefully celebrates that reframing of our farm. All good farms have a junk pile. It comes with the farm in a succession of owners. Each farmer and generation contributes to the collection of odd machine parts, old equipment, and discarded history. The pile stays put as if planted and part of the landscape growing with each decade. No one plans to grow a junk pile, but one naturally evolves along with farmers and their history. After I spoke at a farm conference in Wisconsin, an old farmer dressed in overalls approached me to talk about his junk pile. Out here, we don't call them junk piles, he announced. And I thought he was going to use the expression bone pile, which is rarely heard in California. Instead, he said, out here we call them. And then he leaned closer to me as if whispering a, a secret. Out here, we call junk piles inventory. <laughs> I think when you begin to redefine common everyday things as part of your life, part of your work on the farm, you begin to redefine yourself. Farmers tend not to think of themselves as part of that human capital. That's part of a farming operation. Uh, and we need to reverse that idea that it's the farmer that's easily thrown away, but let's keep the food. It's the story of how food is grown, which necessarily involves the farmer, that becomes the selling point. My contention is that we need to think of ourselves as growing public food and putting that notion of public back into the equation because in that sense the public has the ability to recognize the story, the complete story. The public has the idea that this isn't just a simple commodity that came from some unknown and we simply eat it. But it's the, the idea that this is something else that nourishes us in many ways and they want to know more. In that sense I think all farmers are what I call cultural workers. 
It's no, di no different than us being like an artist. Business still counts, and I'm certainly not discounting that, but I think farms are becoming part of a public consciousness. In other words, farms and food are becoming connected again. And with that, I think you have a growing personalization of food. For me, it's a personalization of produce, where the goal is that the farm and our farm communities create capital. And that capital is not only recognizing the human capital, along with the economic, but now the social capital. And social capital here means the relationships and the connections between people. Those are valued just as important as anything else. One of the challenges of farming is, of course, how are you defining what is authentic? And I think it comes back to a very simple theory of hard work. When you look at farming operations that it is, are perceived as not hard work, I'm not so sure those are true farming operations. Because all true farmers know this isn't easy work that we do. You step off a tractor, twist your knee, and the next thing you know, you get an infection or laying in an ER room. This is hard work. Yeah, the next step after that was choice between lecture and diarrhea, <laughs> but I didn't want to go there, you know, so. Uh. But it's all part of, again, looking at culture, looking at that cultural part of the work that we do, again, pounding in that notion that this all goes beyond simple economics. There is a saying that my father passed down to me, and in Japanese it goes, nanakorobi ya oki, which translates into fall down seven times, get up eight. That's the essence of hard work. It's the essence that many cultures share that kind of understanding and acknowledging the fact that there will be failures. And it's not a question of failures, it's a question of in responding to that failure. It's, it's the same notion of how do we respond to the insults that we're getting right now. And I think we can honor that when we start bringing out our own personal stories and begin, to, and begin to understand how our own personal stories should be attached to our food. There should be this connection, again, that social capital of the work that we do with the things that we grow. That's, I think, the transform transformative agriculture that I think we're in right now. And I think it's a historic notion because at the same time, we're in an era where I think I believe we can benefit from creative capital. In other words, new ideas, new inspirations, and many of that is going to come from a new generation on the farm. Not only those that are young, but also many of the new generation who did not grow up on farms. And they bring a different spirit. They bring a one wonderful naivete to the work that they do, but it's part of that new capital that is being created on our lands and could transform agriculture. Let me close with this one passage from Wisdom of the Last Farmer that in a way reflects and summarizes this notion of, of transformative agriculture in that it's not just about individuals it's about relationships, and that relationship is always connected to what's the most important thing of a farm. It's the farmer and the land. So here's this one last passage, and after this I'd love to field any questions you might have. I farm with gourmet dust. I breathe it. I eat it. It has become part of me, and I am part of it. I am blessed to have such fine dust. The history of dad's work lingers like dust on our farm. Now I do what he once did, slow, methodical, not a march, but a pace that feels like it could continue forever. Part of a long line of farmers, now I'm also part of something more. When we lose our fathers, we can lose this rhythm. When our fathers are gone, we will miss their dust. Then we find our own pace and tempo and create our own trails of dust. The meaning of dad is found in these fields. He would want us to judge him by his works, 
the work seen in the land. As I walk these lands, the farm becomes the father imbued with ghosts. Walking these fields of gold as often as I do, I will always think of my father. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if some people had some questions. Uh, go ahead. Uh -huh. And I'll repeat the questions oh, too. So, okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. That would be great. Was my father's father a farmer? Very good question. Okay, my father's farmer was my grandfather, and he immigrated from Japan. Uh, they were part of the rural peasant farming society of Japan. Interestingly, both my grandfathers, and certain cultural f cultures, this fits well. They were both second sons growing up on a family farm in Japan, which meant what? They weren't going to get the land. So suddenly they became pioneers because there wasn't a lot for them in Japan. So that's why they immigrated. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Uh huh. Well, I apologize. I'm not going to work, mm -hmm. but I will. I do fourth generation in our section. Did you write anything about, did you have the ceiling, uh, and I don't know when I did, but I do know it happened, that you had to take the farm from your dad? Ah. Take as in he was not willing to let go? Take? Well, Mm -hmm. virtually every day. Mm -hmm. But whether either one submitted or not, I guess it's my decision now. Sure, absolutely. So the, que when that happened to you. Yeah, the question was, was there a moment when I feel I had to take the farm from my dad? Uh, and I, hopefully that cap captured that. Uh, I tell you the moment when I, let me back up a little. When I was in high school, I broke my dad's heart and I told him, and I can remember the scene. Picture a high school 17, 18 year old kid, long hair, listening to rock music, playing a guitar. My dad comes in and asks me if he, I could help him in the fields. And I said, Dad, I'm never going to come back to this farm. And then I turned up the music even louder, right? <laughs> Some of us might relate to that or feel guilty about that. So I told my dad I'm never going to farm. Uh, and he just stepped out of the room. Didn't say a word after that. Never questioned me. Never challenged me. I went off to college, uh, and I. Uh, this, and this is how I, much I planned not to farm. I went to the college campus that I thought my parents would never want to go to, so I went to Berkeley, <laughs> and, and they never visited me on campus. And if that wasn't far enough, I decided to become an exchange student. So I went to Japan for two years to escape the farm. So I was thousands of thousands of miles away, living in a foreign country. And what do I end up doing? I decided to go visit the village that my grandparents had immigrated from, and they had never gone back. And I found myself working in this rice field. The very thing I was escaping, I ended up coming to. Uh, but, I dis but I realized rice was an alien crop to me. I've eaten it my whole life, but I didn't know how to grow it. And I thought, you know, maybe... I should go full circle and go back to the farm. I go back to the farm after I finished that college, uh, and I started farming organically. And if there was a moment that I took the farm from my dad, it was that moment where I told dad that we want to farm organically. And he wasn't quite sure about this. So I said, well, we're going to do all this. And this was in the 80s, where there was a lot of uh, sort of free expression in terms of how you farmed organically. Uh, no one quite knew how to do it. No one knew what to do. Uh, uh, there were rough guidelines, so to speak. Uh, so what happened was uh, I, com I transitioned our farm to organic, and I was trying to develop a relationship with the weeds. So, and we live about a quarter mile f apart from each other, his farmhouse and my farmhouse, which my wife said is the exact right distance between a mother and father-in-law, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so uh, around our house, the weeds were just going wild. But as you drove closer to my dad's house, it was like concentric circles of cleanliness. He would go out and hand shovel all the weeds because he could not bear to see the weeds growing so wild. Uh, and it was still farmed organically, except with a lot of la manual labor put in, uh, input. And that's when I realized that, yeah, I guess I'm taking 
the farm from my dad. But like many things, he was one, happy that I had come back to the farm. And two, another thing simultaneously began to happen. I had to farm without herbicides. I didn't know how to do this. Who farmed without herbicide? My dad did when he was younger. So I'd go ask him and he'd go, you know, there's this one plow we used to use and we'd go to the junk pile. And he'd pull out this one plow or this one, it was a Bezzeriti blade that we used at one point. And, and, and he showed me how it worked and how maybe we could adapt it and fi fix it on a tractor. And I realized my dad, if you're an anthropologist, he was the one that had native competency, they may call it. He understood knowledge and that I never had access to. So he became my best asset in terms of understanding how to farm organically. So that may have been the moment that there was this taking. Do you have someone coming along behind you? Uh, my daughter is expressing interest in farming. Uh, she, uh, uh, as I said, I think she's wonderfully naive. Uh, and yet she has this energy and will. And she probably has that creative capital that I don't have that will catapult us in a new direction. And part of that creative capital, she's already started doing, where we redesigned our webpage. It's masamoto.com. And she said, Dad, let's divide, divide who we are by our farm. So our farm has the, you know, the, the, the fruit and the tree fruit farm, but it's a literary farm with my writing. There's a public farm because we do public events, some of them on our farm. So she re is already redefining how we farm. And I think that's going to be wonderful because it could be this blend of new technologies. I mean, we're, we're, we're exploring doing, we have a Facebook page now. We're going to explore doing tweets and Twittering and all this <laughs> other stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, and she's, she's, she's good at that and understanding the pitfalls, the limitations. So this whole world of social media has exploded. And how do we work that? And or how does it integrate with what we do? Uh, and I'm very excited about that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Could you talk about Oh, okay. Uh -huh. um, I have gone back in time and I keep looking for old heirloom varieties to plant. Uh, so we planted this one variety. How many of you remember Alberta peaches? Okay. And I bet you if we went around we could graph it. It's all by age, right? Because Alberta, <laughs> Alberta was the peach probably about two generations ago. Uh, and it slowly fell out of fa favor. Uh, it's a wonderful peach, golden yellow when it's ripe. Uh, the problem is with Albertas, some, most, many of them, is if you stare at them, they bruise. Okay? <laughs> they don't quite fit in the modern marketplace. And so I planted about a half acre of these Albertas, 50 trees. Not sure if I could figure out how to grow them. I, they're fantastic, but they do are very delicate. So it was a challenge. Do I try to fit this old world technology into the new world? And I talked with a, a, a bunch of people and we thought, well, maybe we could pack them in different types of boxes and handle them differently. And it was getting very complicated. Uh, so I thought, well, what's the one moment, talking about public stories, public memory, what's the one moment I'd love to have the public share? And that's that moment of truth for at least the peach farmer. You work this entire year, and when you're ready to pick a peach, you have to make the distinction, is this ripe or not? And the reason why is once you pick it, there's no do-overs. You can't put it back on the tree. And I thought, I want the public to feel the angst that I have when I'm trying to make this decision. So we started this program where we uh, have people adopt a peach tree. And I'll just summarize it very quickly. And it's actually posted on our web page now. Uh, groups so will be interested in this. They fill out adoption papers where they have to answer some questions. Because the whole notion is we don't want anybody on the farm. These are our babies. And we want them to have ownership. So we ask the question, what would you do with 500 pounds of peaches? And some people answer flippantly, we'd eat them. <laughs> I don't want that person on our farm. <laughs> you know, I want someone who cares, who someone says, we need to think about this and figure out how do, we, how do we use some of it, how do we give it away, how do we 
how do we preserve? How, what kind of recipes do you use to preserve? And, and it generates this ownership of how, how they're going to uh, be involved with the harvest. So we accept them into the program, they pay a fee, and then I uh, uh, send them updates throughout the year from bloom to, to thinning to how the peach are growing. And the key is they come at harvest time which is two weekends either in July, last two weekends in July, or the first two weekends in August. And when we first started this, we immediately got pushback because people wanted to commit. They said, can't you tell us which weekends to come? And I said, no. And they couldn't understand that this is nature that dictates this. So I finally came up, and this is the idea of the power of language and words. I came up with this phrase, we do not do Caesarean peaches. <laughs> They got it. They understood that. Especially anyone who was a mother and delivered. They understood that very, very quickly. Uh, so we have this basically like a harvest festival, but it's the same way. Unlike a U-Pick, it's set up just as if we were doing harvest. They pack into the same boxes I use. We use the same ladders. We do an orientation. They come and pick. They harvest. It could be hot in Fresno. We've had days that are 108 degrees when they're harvesting. So they understood why you begin early, uh, and then uh, they load up their cars and vans and then head back. About two-thirds of them come from out of the area, San Francisco, the Bay Area. Some come from out of state, uh, and these groups come and harvest these peaches and go home. And some wonderful things have happened, such as the gift economy with food. We have forgotten that food was traditionally given as gifts. And when you have so many peaches, what do you do? You give them away. And people go, I don't know how to give away peaches. And I said, practice. <laughs> so they do. There's one, uh, I'll try to make this short. There's one uh, friend, uh, he had a grumpy neighbor across the street, never talked to them. So he said, I'm going to give them a box of peaches. And these are wonderful peaches. So they went over there, set them on the doorstep, rang the doorbell, and then got scared and ran back to their house <laughs> and peeked through the window. And they saw the neighbor come out, opens the door, looks down, looks at these peaches, you know, and realizes what they are. The next day, they started talking to each other. And it was that gift economy that's part of that social capital that could surround fruit. So that's the spin-offs, the wonderful spin-offs from that. So uh, right behind you, Jerry. I want to know more about how you market. Where do these peaches go? How are they shipped? And, and so I will know how you find them. Okay. <laughs> okay. The, the question is, how do I market where fruit shipped? Uh, 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 how can you buy them? Uh, when we started, when we first started uh, farming organically and looking for markets, it was a challenge because the system wasn't set up for something that was a little more delicate, that didn't have shelf life for a couple years. So it took a while, but and now there's more and more networks out there. And part of the key was literally understanding when this pellet comes in, it can't sit on a dock in the middle of, of a, of a you know, Midwestern summer for a couple hours. It needs, to keep in, be, it needs to be in cold storage, and it needs to be sold fast. What does that mean? It partly means consumers need to be aware that here's this great peach. It's not going to be here for very long, so if you want it, get it now. Don't bank on uh, two months from now or in December, oh, I want to make that peach pie. Uh, and and, and the, the world has shifted. We've gotten what I call partners all along the way. We do ship across country. We actually ship a lot into Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, and part of it had to do with this uh, contextual history of Minneapolis and St. Paul. I don't know if anyone have lived in Minneapolis and St. Paul. You know the food co-ops there? You ever been to Mississippi co-op? And we sell into it. Uh, the, the Twin Cities have this long history of groups that form the food co-op. Our peaches fit well within that uh, strategy, within that understanding, within that contextual frame of how food should be treated. So there's a distributor there, Roots and Fruits, who buys our produce and it goes to these markets. And that's what we find all along our, uh, our network of how they're, how, how they're distributed. The problem I have is I don't, it's in the middle of summer and I can't follow all that. This summer we're trying to f create a program where we could get feedback from people uh, and find out where there are, 
where are the fruit and, and, and publicize it from our own way. So will they come out to Iowa? I'm trying to think if they've ever been here. I believe there's a market someplace in Des Moines that carried them once because someone told me that. Is that right? Yeah. That's fantastic. And the name of the co-op? Wheatfields. Wheatfields Co-op. And do you know the distributor that it comes from? It's coming from Roots, Roots and Fruits. Fruits. And see, these, these are the wonderful, co- I hope they were good. And these are the wonderful networks, actually with social media, we can make this full loop now. Uh, so there is this, uh, this, idea that we have, that we're going to have sort of like friends of moss out there, that if they buy our peaches, because all our fruit actually are now stickered. And on the sticker, it has that price lookup, but also has our web page on it. So people could then contact me, say, hey, we found our peaches, and, and we'll, make, we'll make a list. And, sort of, and this is perfect for the younger folks who do Facebook, right? This is all the stuff that fits wonderful on there. And in fact, we have uh, certain, certain peaches, very limited supply, we sell to certain stores. And we understand now there's sort of like a, uh, uh, this instant tweet that goes out. Moss's peaches are there. And they all rush and they buy them within the first hour or two. You know, and they're gone. And these were some of the best of the best. You know? and, and so I think that's kind of fun. Because whoever thought of having fun sourcing food, and I'm going to put that fun equation back into that. So anyway, so another question? Jerry, yeah. Uh, Moss, I was interested in, in how, how your artistic expression was released. In other hmm. words, how you arrived at this. Mm-hmm. H- had you taken a different path from Berkeley and not come back to farming, hmm. do you, huh. have you ever speculated do you That's think really it would have question. been released if you had been in a different vocation? Huh. The question is, how is my artistic expression released and would it have been different had I followed a different path? You know, that's a great question, Jerry. No one has ever asked me that or I've, I've thought about that. At one point I thought, well, maybe I should become an attorney. And I th- <laughs> I made the right career choice. Unless there's some attorneys in the audience. Of course, they wouldn't admit it right now. <laughs> But there's no new progressive attorneys now. All right. But anyway, uh, uh, I think had I gone a different direction, I don't think this artistic expression would have been there. Because there's something about working the land and the, and the way I, in, I feel it, I taste it, I interact with it, that brings out that artistic expression. Uh, Someone claimed I was one of the first to use the idea of having a fruit orgasm. Uh, and I used that in some of my terms. And it dawned on me because some, someone then said, well, Masumoto, he writes fruit porn. <laughs> and I thought about that. And I thought, one, there's different forms of expression. And I thought, well, hell, porn sells. <laughs> What's wrong with that? So anyway, uh, but I think that notion of having that intimate, authentic connection brings out that artistry. And I couldn't impose it any other way. And that's why all the work we do is embedded in this sense of being authentic. And it's probably why I don't write fiction. Because anytime I've attempted to write fiction, it's, it got pulled back to nonfiction. Because that's what my world is anchored in. It's anchored in this world of the real. So that's why when I write essays or when I write any of my prose, it's got to be anchored in the real, which makes a challenge. Because I can't conveniently change things. I can't conveniently change my sister. I can't conveniently change my aunt and make her actually really pleasant. But anyway, so... uh, That's a great question, Jerry. Well, Moss, okay. I know we could keep you going here all night. I know when you've had it. You, it Moss was, <laughs> they started this morning at 4 o'clock. So. <laughs> if, if you want to do and a few more questions, I can. I'm more than welcome to. Well, let me, let me, let me make a suggestion, and right. we can mm-hmm. go either way with it. Uh, we've got some refreshments here, and uh, so uh, please help yourself to them. If, if, you, and if you want to go with some more questions, and you want to go with that's okay, too. And books. And then uh, there are some books there, and I'm sure Moss would be happy to Absolutely. for you. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so, and, and it would give us time to have some. Why don't we do that then? Formal conversation. All right. Thank you very much.